welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My guest today is current Calgary City Councillor for Ward 3, Jody Gondek, and current mayoral candidate for the City of Calgary, Jody. Jody, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks so much for having me on. Um, my first question, as always, is where does your sense of duty come from? I think it comes from uh, my family. My parents have always instilled in me this um, this responsibility, this sense of responsibility to give back when I can. Um, my mom, you know, raised me to make sure that I would understand where and how I could help out people in need. And my dad uh, volunteered in so many different ways in the communities that we lived in. And that's really where I get it from. I, I guess I've never really thought about that question because I've just been raised that way. Um, giving back can be in a multiple forms. It can be through nonprofits. It can be through a business. It can be through your personal life. But you chose the path of politics. You chose to get involved in 2017 to run for city council. Um, were your parents political or is are you sort of the black sheep of the family and went the political route? <laughs> um, it's interesting. My dad always wanted me to take an interest in politics. And I remember <laughs> as a kid saying, whatever, dad, that's like totally boring. I'm going to go listen to some records and just, <laughs> you know, as kids do, completely ignoring it. And I began to get sort of involved with understanding, you know, what the parties were and all that sort of thing in my early 20s. But really, like I had better things to do. Um, but it's, it's unfortunate that you don't realize something until it's too late. And I would say when my dad passed away really unexpectedly in 2003, it woke me up and it made me realize just how important it is to understand who you're electing and what it means to have a certain government in power. And after he passed, he had a couple of projects on the go that I sort of stepped in and picked up and I would go to the meetings and the presentations that he was supposed to deliver. And so as unfortunate as it was to lose him, it's also the reason that I became more engaged in community building. It's a reason that I started to volunteer in a greater capacity um, in terms of shaping what our communities needed into the future. And that's how I became interested in politics ultimately, because I worked on the fringes and tried to influence from the outside for a decade and then realized that sometimes you just need to take the plunge and try to get into that decision-making seat. So in 2017, you made that decision. You made that decision, I'm assuming in 2016, you made that decision, you ran in 2017, what you were elected. What was the issue that was burning for you to get involved at that time? Because in 2013, 10 years after your father had passed away, uh, there was an election as well. 2017 was the first four year term. So why in 2017? What was the issue in 2017? I think I was still learning and I was going on this journey that I had entered unexpectedly and I didn't know where it would take me. And I think by 2016, I had finally had enough of trying to make recommendations and convince the decision makers that they were getting some things wrong. I remember there was a redevelopment in my community where as a member of planning commission, I had said, please don't approve this right away. Stop at first reading and make sure the community can see what it's going to look like. And council didn't listen to me in that capacity. That was incredibly frustrating. Um, there was funding that was desperately needed for Vivo, our local rec center. And I kept getting the door closed saying, you know, no, there's no money. We can't find any money. You know, it, it, there isn't any. And so it was things like that that made me think, okay, I don't believe this anymore. I need to get in there and see for myself if this is a fact or if I can change things. And so that's when I decided in 2016 in November that I was going to take the plunge. And since I did get elected, you know, with the faith of my constituents behind me, I went in there and I found them the money for Vivo because it did exist. We just yeah. weren't looking in the right places. And I've been able to get a lot of infrastructure projects approved and move forward because I figured out what was holding us back. And I figured out how to change the processes in a way that actually helps community members have a greater quality of life instead of just saying, this is the way we've always done things. Running for politics, especially at a municipal level, because municipal politics is the frontline politics of every decision. It is the, it is the politics that uh, influence people's budgets in their own personal house on a daily basis. Um, 
when you decided to run in 2017 or 2016 in November and then were elected in 2017, was it hard to make that decision because you were now going out and asking people to vote for you? You were going out there to say, hey, I am the right person for this job. So take me through that process of going door to door your first election and getting people to say, I will vote for you. I will vote for, yes, I will vote for Dr. Jody, Jyoti Gondek. It was, um, it was wild. It was interesting. Um, I had helped on other campaigns before and I was used to talking up the candidate yeah. and I was used to hitting the doors and saying, you know, this person is the person you need to believe in. And I was used to all of that. And I remember hitting the first door as the candidate and just having no words and thinking, Oh, how am I going to do this? I'm not used to talking about myself. I'm not used to saying, you know, I'm your person. And it took about oh, two hours in that first day of door knocking to really get comfortable um, promoting yourself. It's not something that I've done before. So 2017 was a real eye opener in what it takes to balance your own personal desire to be a humble person with the fact that you've got to get into shameless self-promotion or you're not going to win. So that was, that was a very interesting lesson. Uh, you were the successful candidate in that election. Um, getting into council, now being on the other side of the table, now making the decision, um, you are elected in Calgary at a ward level, but you have to represent the whole city. How did you balance the needs of your community against the needs of the city? Because sometimes you have to say, yes, I want this a new arena or I need this upgrade to this field, uh, this park, but it's not as important as something else that might be downtown Calgary. So how did you as a city councilor balance that, the needs of your constituents versus the needs of the many? I can probably give you a couple of examples. Um, one of the reasons I ran and when I got onto council, it was pretty clear that I wanted to change the alignment of the green line. I didn't think it should go south first. I always felt and I continue to feel that it should have gone north first. That's where the ridership is. That's where the demand is. That's where transit pays for itself. It's the greatest return on investment. And I still have a hard time getting over that. Um, but I could not convince my colleagues to reconsider the vote. We were too far down the process. Um, so, you know, after a, a year of insisting that we needed to reconsider, I realized that there was no chance of that happening. So I instead shifted my focus to um, working with my colleagues to help them understand there had been no modal progression in transit up in the north central communities of Calgary for years. And so if we're going to build the Green Line project, one of the things that must be embedded in stage one of that project is making sure that there are mobility upgrades to the north. So I fought very hard and we were successful in ensuring that the functional planning stage of the second leg up to the north takes place now. And that's where we're seeing um, how we would go about this business of creating a proper bus rapid transit route until such time that we get money for the train. So it uh, hurts my heart every day to know that the South will get the train first, but I was able to fight for what the North needed for progression. So that's how you balance things. You try to find a win for your communities because you know that they need something, but you also act in the best interest of the city because you know it's important to start a project somewhere. You, uh, you, you've served three, almost three and a half, well, three and a half years as counselor for Ward 3. You made the decision to jump in the mayoral race last year. Um, you have one term on council. Do you think you're ready to be the next mayor of the city of Calgary with only one term of council as a councillor under your belt? Or do you believe that that helps you as the next mayor of Calgary? When I thought about what I was going to do next at the end of November and beginning of December in 2020, it was after we had gone through uh, the last budget cycle that we would go through as this version of council. And I stepped back and thought about, number one, was I still interested in public service? And I was, absolutely. I still had a desire to offer four more years to Calgarians. And I realized that in three short years, I had managed to bring about a lot of change in how we look at our budgets. I had managed to push for a better proportional share of the operating budget for our business community. I had managed to push 
to have an understanding of what our revenue stream could and should be. And I had managed to bring about the change of looking at our assets as a city of Calgary differently. What value did they offer us? How could we monetize them? And knowing that we had made a lot of those major steps and the time that it had taken to get people's mind sh mindset to shift, I made that decision that this was a critical point in our city's path to the future. And as much as people are saying, you know, sometimes you need fresh blood, I was that fresh blood. I decided in 2017 that I wanted to come in and influence decision makers to make those decisions differently. And I had met with success. So I would like to carry on that success, that tenacity and that desire to shift our processes for the greater good of the future of our city. And that's why I made the decision to run. I knew that those three years that I had spent on council positioned me well to hit the ground running. Um, you talked about it a little bit beforehand, but we're going to get into uh, this a little bit because I think this is the most important thing that people, uh, as an avid political watcher, I know this, I don't think most people know this, but the mayor is one vote. You are one vote on the city council. You have to uh, get the majority of your councillors to vote in favor for you. Why do you believe you are the best leader to ensure that the next four years of city council is smooth sailing and not as divisive as I've seen it in the last two years that I've only been in Calgary? Why do you believe you are the best leader to ensure a smooth transition and ensure that work gets done in a proper fashion? It's an interesting um, question about the powers of the mayor. And a lot of times people will say that we have a weak mayor system. And what that essentially means is that the mayor has an equal vote to everyone else and no veto power or no super vote. And that's just by virtue of the Municipal Government Act, which dictates that the mayor is the chief elected officer and then there are members of council, but there's no embedded powers. The thing that happens, though, is when you have a chief elected officer, it's that individual that builds the relationships with the federal and provincial governments. It's that individual that takes responsibility for building all of those plans to see our city move forward. I think things also bottleneck in the office of the mayor because there's a lot of responsibility on one individual. So what I would like to do is ensure that we've got more capacity as a council. Right now we have something called priorities and finance committee and it's all the chairs of the standing policy committees and the uh, audit chair. And we come, to, we come together monthly to talk about obviously priorities and finance. <laughs> yeah. But if we could actually turn that committee into an executive committee of council, a mini cabinet, if you will, you would suddenly have a lot more firepower to go out and reach the other orders of government to move projects forward. It would be, fascinating to see how much more efficient we would be if we deployed people that have relationships for the projects that we need to get going in their capacity as a counselor. So what I would like to do is make sure that I'm building those relationships with whoever wins their council seats and making sure that we've got a broad mix of skills, experience, passion, and relationships in this executive committee so that we can better leverage people's talents and existing relationships to do the right thing. So um, my model of leadership is one where I serve with humility and compassion and I make sure that other people are welcomed on the journey and they're recognized for their role in what we're trying to do. Just on that note, who would make up that executive committee? So it would, I agree with the model of priorities and finance committee where it's the chairs of the standing policy committees and, and the audit chair. I think that's a really good blend, but I think what we need to do moving into this next council is make sure that the existing standing policy committees are actually reflective of the work we need to be doing. The administration itself is going through a bit of a reorg. So we should be looking at our committees at the same time. And we need to make sure that we are mirroring on those committees the important projects and policies that we need to move forward. As someone who comes from a municipal background, I worked in a municipality up in Northern Alberta. I've uh, covered it while, while I was a reporter in Lloydminster back in Ontario as well. I've seen city governance and administration grow, grow, grow. Do you believe, and this might be a tough question to answer, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Do you believe that the city of Calgary's administration is too large as of right now, or do you believe that it is doing its job fairly? 
I believe that city administration is doing the right thing in having a look at how it's organized right now. I don't think that the, the existing structure is the most ideal, efficient or effective one. I think we could be doing things much better. I mean, we've, we've got disconnects between business units and departments. A couple of examples I can give you, um, parks versus recreation, you know, parks, I can't even remember which is which, but one of them owns the operating model for doing bookings. And the other one is responsible for the facility upon which the bookings happen. And the two talk to each other, which is nice, but as an average Calgarian, I don't know which one I would go to to get an answer to my question. So things like that need to get fixed. And here's another really big one. Right now, the land assets that the city owns are stewarded by individual business units. So parks may have a piece of land, water may have a piece of land. And so when our real estate and development services folks have an opportunity to look at a piece of land for someone that may wish to do something on it and we need to change a land use, they first have to negotiate internally with a business unit to bring that land to market. That is so ineffective and inefficient. We should have one point of land stewardship, but we have built this system where it almost becomes proprietary and we make business units feel like they're losing something when we do that. So there's a massive culture shift that needs to happen we need to become a lot more nimble and responsive and our existing structure does not allow us to do that well. Uh, the reason I ask this is because uh, I, I've spoken to my neighbors, I've spoken to uh, uh, my partner who's lived here all his life and he says we're trying to get something done through City Hall is confusing. It, like you said, there's departments after departments and you don't know who you should be talking to. How do you convey that message to the average resident who doesn't want to go to City Hall because they're afraid they're going to be lost and they're not going to be able to find the answer that they're looking for. Is it just to call their counselor, call the mayor? Because that seems like a very redundant thing to call the mayor and then they have to figure it out. But shouldn't it be easier for residents to figure out how to do business with the city? It should be easy to understand how to do business with the city. And I don't think it's by virtue of um, city administration wanting to make things difficult. I just think the system has been in place for so long, it's sort of become this, well, that's how we've always done it. Or no one has stepped back from it enough to say, wow, that's really clunky and doesn't work. So everybody's been running flat out to do their job, but no one's had time to stop and say, am I actually running in the right direction? Do I have to run flat out? Or could I actually do this at a reasonable pace if I did it differently? So one of the things that we did in 2019 was brought in um, an external consultant to look at how we could achieve greater efficiencies. And it's been turned into something called the SAVE program. And I think that program is going to allow us to see where there's overlaps, um, where there are gaps in customer service. So again, I think this reorganization that we're going through will better meet Calgarians' needs. And anytime residents are not getting anywhere, it's perfectly fine to contact your counselor's office because sometimes we may not know that that problem exists because we haven't had to go through it as a citizen. And so please let us know because we're happy to work on making it better. One of the things that I've uh, noticed in the news in the last few months and uh, since I've moved to Calgary is uh, budgeting, budgeting for the city of Calgary. Um, we have some councillors who believe that we should have a 0% increase, some councillors who believe that you have to keep up with inflation, things change, cost of doing business with other organizations do change and they have to, uh, your budget has to go up. Do you believe you're fiscally responsible enough to manage a low increase or a potential 0% increase in the next four years as a potential next mayor of Calgary? Because we are seeing taxes go up. We are seeing people leave on my street alone. We have, I think, 10, 10 to 12 for sale signs. These people are leaving. They're going to other municipalities. They're going to Chestermere. They're going to Airdrie. How do you keep people here, but also keep up with inflation when it comes to working with the budget? I think one of the, the things that I identified early on is that we're not always focusing on the right numbers. And when we talk about a 0% increase, we were talking about a 0% increase to the operating budget, which did not translate to a 0% increase to your property taxes because we weren't looking at the mill rate. So I think the fact that I've been a bit of a disruptive voice when we're budgeting, and I've been asking questions that haven't been asked before, 
is an indication to me that we got so stuck doing things in the same way that you needed some fresh eyes on the process. And I brought those. And instead of always saying, well, a 1% cut is 20 million. So if we do this much of a cut, it's this many million. Okay, well, can't we look at the revenue stream first? Can't we look at what is the assessed value of all of the properties multiplied by last year's mill rate? What do we stand to generate in revenue? Then let's look at the operating budget. We did that for the first time last year. I don't know why that hasn't been done historically. And what we realized was that we had a $30 million gap in what we stood to collect versus what we needed to spend. And that's important to recognize because we had already cut $160 million from the budget in 18 months. So we're not going to cut our way out of this necessarily. And, and that's indicative of it. But I can tell you, 13 million of that 30 million gap was a cut from our provincial partner to our police budget. So now we're left with a $17 million gap. What other responsibilities were offloaded to us that we need to go back and ask the federal and provincial government to renegotiate? That's really the crux of the problem. We exist in an environment where the only certainty of revenue stream we have is property taxes. And we never went back to revisit why we only keep 60% of those taxes that we collect from the only revenue stream we have. You bring up a good point because the uh, the next mayor of the city of Calgary will have to deal with uh, Premier Jason Kenney and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Um, do you believe you were the best person to negotiate with these two men? I believe that the best person to negotiate with these two men at this time is the person that has the best interest of Calgarians at heart. Um, I just did a debate yesterday where my opponent was absolutely fixated on making nice with the provincial government, um, you know, took me to task for calling them out on things they hadn't done well. If you want a mayor of Calgary that is going to be complacent with this provincial government, good luck. We are not getting the things we need. We are not getting the things we deserve. And to sit here quietly on my hands to be nice to somebody who may or may not decide to give us what we deserve, I'm sorry. That's just, that's not the mayor that this city needs. The mayor that this city needs moving forward will fight for what this city deserves. That person will fight for a fair deal. You can't be asking for a fair deal from the federal government if you're not willing to give it to your municipalities. What you need in a leader for the next four years is someone who understands the processes, understands the finances, and will fight for what this city deserves. So what is a fair deal in your eyes? What is a fair deal for Calgary with the city, with the province of Alberta and with the federal government today? What would what would need to be changed to make it a fair deal? Because Jason Kenney is about the fair deals. He believes that we should have a fair deal for uh, from Canada. So from your perspective, what is a fair deal for Calgary today? So for simply looking at the easiest, um, most red tape efficient manner to strike a fair deal, I wanna go back and look at the 60-40 split. How did we come up with that model? Why does it still make sense? And by that, I mean, when the city is responsible for collecting 100% of the property taxes and the province expects us to ship about 40% up to them, how did we come up with that? And it's probably time to revisit it because we've seen a continued decline in our assessed values, especially in our um, depressed downtown properties. So when that's the only revenue stream that we have, it's time to renegotiate it. Secondly, they've cut a lot of our municipal funding. And I'm, I'm not just gonna blame this government. The government prior to the UCP coming in also pulled a fast one on us. Yes, this is the funding stream we're giving you, but we're not gonna give you this money in one year. We're gonna do it over five years. Well, that crushes our ability to get any kind of projects going. And I don't know that most people understand we can't carry a deficit. We are the only order of government that has to operate efficiently without carrying a deficit. So when the province tells us to get our house in order, you built our house. Give us different ways to keep our house in order and we'll gladly do it. But we can't do it when in this bizarre parent-child relationship we have, you haven't considered the fact that we've grown up and we need different tools. You, you spoke about the downtown core and I wanna talk about that briefly because 
the average, I would say the average Calgarian does not go downtown that often. People who work downtown will go down there. But the people in my community of Whitehorn are working in Whitehorn, are working in the surrounding area. I hear councillor after councillor, mayor candidate after mayor candidate say, we need to fix downtown. What about the communities outside of downtown? We can't just focus on the downtown core 24 seven. Yes, there's vacancies and we need to fill them, but we also need to fix the vacancy of houses that are out in the uh, suburbs of Calgary as well, shouldn't we? Chris, you raise a really good point. And I think we get so used to speaking in a certain way that we forget to point out the obvious. The reason that there needs to be a focus on downtown right now is because filling those vacancies actually means that we will have greater appreciation of those assets. And if we can bring our downtown back to even close to what it used to be, those properties will generate more in property taxes. And when they're firing on all cylinders and they're generating the property taxes that we need to fund the operating budget, homeowners will not have the types of increases that we've had to put upon them because those buildings have depreciated. So downtown matters because we lost $16 billion in property value since 2015. That's big. And that's what creates a hole in the budget. So we need to focus on this area because of the property tax it can generate. But I agree. We need to focus on serving our communities. I mean, that's, it's fundamental. Calgarians have made an investment in this city. And I don't mean just financially. People care about this place. They chose to make it home. They chose to set up a business here. They chose to make their community beautiful and they care. We owe you a return on that investment by giving you complete communities with great amenities, with great public transit. But to do that, we've only got that one tool of property taxes. So that's why we are so fixated on filling those vacancies. Um Thank you for answering that and thank you for explaining that because I think most people don't understand that that is why there's been a big fixation on the downtown core is because we are losing so much money. Um, one of the things that came up during your first term as a councillor and will be a major issue going forward is recovery from this pandemic. We are seeing high unemployment rates, higher unemployment rates than there were when you first started because of COVID-19. We are seeing uh, homeowners not, even, not able to afford their property taxes because they're not working. How do we get out of this pandemic fiscally responsible, but also ensuring that the people who are struggling the most aren't left behind? Excellent question, Chris. And it's something that we can't do alone as a city. And this is where I have been incredibly thankful to the two other orders of government for recognizing that we need help for our citizens. As a municipal government, we are the ones that see things unfolding on the streets that we represent. And these folks come to us. And I can tell you in my ward, um, as a particularly good example, um, I've got families that were getting by, just getting by. And I've been watching this since 2014. There's people that were starting to dip a little bit in terms of their ability to be self-sufficient. They went from being dual income households to single income. And then that single income went away and the other partner had to go and find, you know, two different part-time jobs to make ends meet. And people are losing their ability to pay their mortgages. They can't pay their rent. They can barely put food on the table. But these are, these are the people in hidden positions of vulnerability because no one sees it. Everyone assumes that they've got a roof over their head and they're fine. But I can tell you there's residents in Ward 3 that are in a lot of trouble and they don't know how to access the services to help them with housing, to help them with situations of poverty, to help them with their mental health and their social services because we literally have zero social service agencies up here. I have nothing in Ward 3. So those folks are really hurting and they don't know where to get help. So we've got to get better at understanding that this could hit any one of us. I mean, Ron Kneebone at the School of Public Policy um, publishes great little policy shorts. And the most recent one he did indicates that 350 Calgarians, new Calgarians every month since 2019 have had to access shelter. They have lost their ability to put a roof over their own head. That's tragic and it's big and we need to address things like that. 
Well, homelessness is a major issue and it's I it's becoming more prevalent as the days go on because when I first moved to Calgary in 2019, it was I I would see potentially I would help out a homeless person here or there who I saw on the street. But now if you drive around even Ward 10, not downtown core, but Ward 10, you are seeing more homeless people and vagrancy issues that are coming up and uh, becoming more of a, uh, 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 it's becoming more of a sight, more seen, I should say. I apologize for that. Um, how do we address the homelessness issue as well? Because we have to help out everyone and not just the people who, who do have a house uh, roof over their head, but also the people who are out on the street. So how are we addressing the homelessness issue as well? Well, the homelessness issue has, um, has haunted us for a number of years and it just continues to get worse. And I think the biggest thing we need to recognize is the idea of housing first is exactly that. That's your first step to put a roof over someone's head to allow them to live with some dignity and respect, but it doesn't end there. You need to make sure that the wraparound services are in place. We don't know what led this particular individual or this family to be in a position of vulnerability. So let's find out. And right now it's incredibly complicated to do that because the service organizations that take care of folks are all separated. They're all independent of each other. They, if they would come together, if we had a means by which to do a wraparound model of caring for people, instead of saying, for housing, you go here, for mental health supports, you go here, for addictions and recovery, it's this, there's got to be a better model and it must be mobile. Because once you put a roof over somebody's head, expecting them to move because they're in a different situation is incredibly disruptive and it can often re-traumatize them and put them back into a greater position of vulnerability. So let's get this right. Let's make sure that housing first is exactly that. It's a first step, but then you've got the wraparound services to take care of families and individuals who have very complex needs. Back to COVID-19, um, in your first term as a mayor, as the next mayor of the city of Calgary, you will have to deal with the recovery of COVID-19 oil prices collapsing in the downtown core. You'll have to uh, uh, deal with, like we said, homelessness issues, uh, the arena. But the one issue that you talked about and was prevalent in 2017 when you ran, the Green Line. The province is holding this, this decision up. They are waiting for uh, potentially to see who the next mayor is going to be. But um, how do we ensure that this project gets shoveled in the ground and gets going? Because the people in the north, in particular Ward 3 and uh, the lower, uh, I think Ward 5, if I'm not mistaken, uh, they want this project. How do we ensure this project goes forward as in your first term as mayor? I think you raise a really interesting point about why the provincial government is holding this up. And I would like to think that it's not for political reasons. And you know what, to your point about Ward 3 needing the service, Ward 4 does as well and Ward, Ward four, 7. Sorry. Yeah. Ward 4 could not be more partisan. So if this is a gamesmanship issue, then the line would have gone north because you've got strong proponents of the UCP there. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be ever hopeful and say that I don't think this is political, but you know, I'm also not trying to be Pollyanna about this. If it is political, I would remind the government that this is 20,000 jobs that Calgarians desperately need. Those jobs translate to income and income tax is something that this provincial government should probably think about. Not to mention the fact that COVID has put people into greater positions of precarious employment. And so when you've got people that have had to cut down from two vehicles to one or get rid of their vehicle entirely because they can't afford it and their family still needs to get to work and school, they are now more than ever in need of a strong transit network. To deny them that opportunity is not serving your constituents. And if it's for political reasons, shame on you. So I would like to think it's not political. I don't know what these technical issues are that they're waiting to resolve, but I sure hope they get resolved quickly. We are uh, six months, or uh, I don't know the exact date right now, May to October, away from the next election. 
after October 19th, you were sworn in as mayor. I know it doesn't happen the day after, but the, the next council meeting, you were sworn in as mayor. What is the first issue that you have to address? I would characterize it less as an issue and more of a task. And that is to immediately get to know everyone on council in a meaningful way. These are the 14 people that I will be working with for the next four years. And reaching out to them immediately is incredibly important. To set up meetings to talk about what it is that they wish to do, what are the strengths that they bring, and how would they like to work together as a team. If you don't build those relationships quickly and early, you will pay for it for the next four years. So my number one job will be to make sure that I'm assembling a team that is strong and understands that we all have a common goal. So that would be job number one. At the same time, concurrently, because one must be able to walk and chew gum at the same time if you're the mayor, ah. is to make sure that some of the things we've approved keep moving forward. Um, moving forward with the downtown strategy will be critical. Making sure that we are holding true to our mental health and addiction strategy will be critical to take care of people in positions of vulnerability. We will need to concurrently ensure that we are doing the right things for Calgarians and moving things forward. And then on that note, what is one task or issue that you weren't able to accomplish in your first year as a first term as a counselor, but you want to get to as the next mayor of the city of Calgary? Well, we have slowly been creeping towards budget reform. And um, is it the pace of change I wanted? <laughs> Not exactly. But at the same time, you know, I realized that I've got colleagues in administration as well as council who needed some time to understand what that reform would look like. And I think we're in a position to make some dramatic changes um, in this upcoming budget cycle because it's the fourth year of a four year budget. We can implement some changes and try some things out that get us into really good shape for setting the next four year budget in a way that we consider revenues as much as we consider the operating dollars. And I would love for us to think about where we can divest ourselves of assets that we don't need not only for the one-time uplift of, of selling a piece of land, but to make sure that there's a business operating on that land that's paying taxes in perpetuity. We've got to get much smarter about our land holdings and our buildings and, and what we can do to monetize them. Uh, last question before we do the wrap up here. What does Calgary mean to you? Calgary means opportunity to me. It always has. Um, and I don't mean opportunity only in the economic sense or the job sense. Um, although this is a place that took a chance on me. I'm a social scientist, um, had no business being in business, so to speak, if you were looking at me from a very traditional point of view. But I had a couple of major corporations give me a chance to do some marketing, to do some finance, strategic planning. And I appreciated that chance to become who I am today. But I think the bigger opportunity that Calgary presents to people is you can call this place home. And you can have an amazing life here. You can build a family here. You can, you know, build a business. This place is incredible. It offers so much to us. And that's frankly the reason that I have this desire to give back and serve for another four years. It's a place of opportunity. It needs to be profiled as such. We need to build our brand independent of our provincial brand. And we need to show the world that we are progressive. We are up to speed on the things we need to do globally in terms of sustainability and inclusion. And we are the place that you want to be. This is the city that you want to be in. And my last question before we do say our goodbyes, why should people vote for you? When I made my decision in December, it was very carefully considered. I thought about whether I bring the financial wherewithal whether I bring an understanding of the social issues, whether I have a comprehension of the systems and policies within which I need to work. And as I evaluated all of that, the answer was yes. So I have confidence in my qualifications and my capabilities and my experience. And probably as important is my passion for this city. I was horrified when I saw anti-mask rallies, so-called anti-mask rallies, which were really just masquerading um, as an opportunity for groups like the Soldiers of Odin and the Proud Boys to march in our city, um, sending their message of hate. I hate the fact that they were able to do that. And what I hate even more than that is that it got picked up globally. 
that is not the impression of this city that anybody needs to have. And I will fight every day to make sure that those groups understand they don't have a home here. They do not belong here. Everyone else who cares about this place, cares about each other and cares about humanity belongs in this city. There is no room for hate in this city from groups like that. So it's a combination of experience and passion that led me to run. And when I made my announcement early in January, I did not look at the field and worry about whether the incumbent was in or out. I did not worry about stacking myself up against the other candidates. I believed in my abilities and I believed that I'm the leader for the times and I still continue to believe that. How can people get a hold of you if they wanna learn more about your campaign? Well, uh, I have a website, which is jyotigondek.ca, J-Y-O-T-I-G-O-N-D-E-K.ca. There you will find a little bit of a bio. You will figure out there that I am a giant nerd because there's major policy pieces on there. Um, you'll see what my vision is. There's just a lot about me on there, and I'm pretty active on social media as well. Um, you know, I post a lot of stuff on Twitter, we're on LinkedIn, we're on Facebook, we're on uh, Instagram. So you can find me in a lot of different places and I'm always happy to engage. We're doing these things called coffee parties as much as we can because I can't go door knocking and I can't have events. So I have these little Zoom meetings with uh, a bunch of people and they provide me with their insights on what they want to see from their city into the future. And you can ask me any questions you want to, and I will gladly answer them. Awesome. Jyoti, uh, Councillor Gondek, uh, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. For my listeners, I will link uh, the councillor's uh, website, her Instagram, her Twitter, all of her social media is in the show notes. So please follow her and get out and learn a little bit more and get involved and make sure you get it and vote on October 18th. Thank you so much, Jody, for doing this. Thanks for having me on and have a wonderful day.